I'm so happy to have you with me this week for a little exploration, a solo episode where I am exploring these concepts or patterns that you might carry of a life devoted to, all wrapped up in, or consumed by hard work. How can we lighten our load? How can we break the patterns of a life filled to overflowing with hard work? And how can we help with that levity, with that space for play and curiosity, be better at the work that we love to do? Thanks for joining me. So glad to have you here. Living in a stressful world doesn't mean you have to give up on happiness. Instead, you can shift your perspective of stress and discover how to live your life in flow. Welcome to Happified. I'm your host, Susie Vine. Join me for inspiration and interviews with folks who are shining their light in the world in the areas of positive mindset, health, and wellness. I'm so happy to have you here. What if you could maximize your meditation practice with a tool that maximizes your time and attention with images and affirmations carefully selected to boost your positivity, to help you integrate your intentions into your subconscious? I have a special gift available for you. Visit happifiedlife.com and click on the Start Off Happy button to take a look at the phenomenal technology created by Positive Prime that uses neuroplasticity to literally wire your brain for more happiness, higher productivity, better relationships, and greater success. Head over to the happifiedlife.com page to start off happy with Positive Prime. Enjoy it free for 30 days. Welcome back. I am so happy to have you with me this week for another episode where I'm exploring some concepts and ideas that I've been ruminating on. I'd love to hear what you think after we explore some of these ideas. Please let me know. Uh, Feel free to reach out to me through the website, happifiedlife.com. Dot com through the Facebook group live with less stress there's always conversation and great shares going on there in the community and let's dig in to today's exploration here's the question that I have for you this week why is it so hard to believe that life doesn't have to be hard and this is definitely a big question there is certainly not a one size fits all solution. And if you love working really, really hard, then by all means, if it works for you, go ahead and keep it up. But myself and in my exploration, my studies into stress and the way that it impacts people, the way that it can weigh people down, impact their health, impact their relationships with the people that they want to be closest and most present with, You know, it's really heartbreaking for me when I see the stress of people working themselves to their limits in the way that that makes them more isolated in the relationships that are the most important to them. And stress can even undermine your success. So is it possible that by working yourself as hard as you can manage, you're actually blocking or delaying or making it more difficult for you to reach the success that you're looking for? These are also some big questions. So let's take a look at at what is this we have to work hard to be successful, to move ahead, to be worthy contributors of society. Mindsets or ideas that we carry. Maybe you don't already. And if that's the case, I'd love to hear from you too. Is this something that you've never had a problem with? It's never really resonated with you. You didn't grow up in a family where this was the norm. Um, In my own childhood and my experience in the culture of the Midwest where I was raised, there's definitely that Midwestern work ethic, right? Real bootstrap culture. We bring ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We don't need handouts. We don't need a lift from other people. Being a self-made man or woman or gender with which you best identify is of the utmost importance, right? We don't need to be lifted up by others. We can do it ourselves. And as a woman growing in an age where men still were a bit strongly gender-based in the Midwest, I went through that even more reactionary 
Anything a man can do, I can do just as well. In fact, stand back, I'm going to show you. Until I recognized that if they really wanted to put themselves out, strain themselves in their back, I didn't have to prove anything anymore. And they could, as long as they didn't underestimate my mental acuity. That's a story for another day. So where do we come from this admiration, not only of self-made people, but of the sacrifices that people make in order to reach this image of success? And success by whose assessment, really, right? What is this badge of honor that we carry for self-sacrifice? Why do we have to be martyring ourselves and having too little sleep, bragging about too many hours in the office, how many hours over 40 we worked that week. You know, there is a book called The 4-Hour Work Week that a lot of people have used to transform the way that they work and show up to what they do in their lives. But we'll come back around to that. And uh, so where is this, you know, badge of honor that we get? What is this you know, feeling that by sacrificing, we are more worthy of attention, of approval, of, you know, promotion, per se. Um, concepts. As I was talking with friends about this idea before I started, you know, creating this episode, um, the concept as a child, you should always look busy, you know, don't look like you're not busy. You'll be asking for an extra assignment, first of all. Um, there's always work to be done. Personally, growing up on a farm, that was never in question. You know, um, sitting down, having leisure, a lazy morning, a late start. There's always work to be done. By taking that time for yourself, you're shorting someone or something else. Um, and so, you know, if there's ever any question, just refer to the to-do list, the chores, the agenda. There's always more. And so it can be hard to put value. It can be hard to hold space for rest, leisure, recovery, dare I say laziness. Although if you know me and if you've been listening to me for a while, you know that I find a lot of spark and inspiration and even benefit to incorporating a little laziness when it's in balance. As in all things, we always have to be finding balance. And I hope balance isn't a triggering word for you, work-life balance, this um, unachievable goal, this by someone else's definition of what balance looks like. I use balance more as a term or synonymous to harmony. What helps things be in flow? So what kind of balance that teeter-totter is still in motion can we find where there's an opportunity for rest, for recovery, even for laziness? Now, certainly we in the US, our culture, we have a lot of remnants of this puritanical culture that founded the country, that inspired this whole movement across this open land and this concept this ego at the time that we had the right to claim it, to bend it to our will, all of these broken ideas that sometimes still come up and choke and strangle us and really stymie our progress. Um, so, you know, there's plenty of biblical scriptures as I was doing a quick search also in reference to idleness. And um, it's really interesting to see how badly that shapes up. And I have some concepts about that, really. I mean, the Bible was written in a time when people needed a moral code, um, a set of laws or structure, and it served that purpose very well. And, you know, survival was not a given in the times that the book was written. And not being willing to work, um, not being committed to production um, was life risking, right? You know, you were risking not only your own, but the livelihood of all of your people, your clan, your family. So, you know, certainly we had to have large families. We had to work very hard in order to secure the perpetuation of our people. So in and of its own time, it served its 
purpose, but I think there's a limitation there. It isn't a blanket prescription. And as I was saying already, you know, these things, these parenting models have just come down through time, through culture, in different ways, in different levels, in different cultures, in different religions. And this idea or this picture of self-sacrifice, not only in cultural readings in scripture, um, but also just in the generational patterns, this self-sacrificing model. There were certainly times when survival was so much more at risk that this personal sacrifice was necessary. And how much is that still relevant? How much do we have to continue living out the patterns that we have seen in our parents and their parents and their parents before them, right? Really important questions to kind of get off the hamster wheel, take a step back and take a look at it and ask yourself, is this relevant? Is this still moving me forward? Is this serving me and my family in the way that at one point it could have? You know, I'm sure everyone can bring to mind, you know, Benjamin Franklin is credited with the statement, idle hands are the devil's playthings. That was the first quote on idleness that came to my mind. And I can tell you there are dozens of others throughout time by um, authors, philosophers, playwrights, and even, um, you know, pop culture icons. So that's a fun rabbit hole for your leisure, which I hope I can inspire you through this conversation to indulge in. But what is this concept that we have to, when we reach success, when we have a reward, is there something in us that feels like we have to be worthy of it, that we have to earn our success? And the only way to earn success is by very hard work, by devoting ourselves, by even compromising our well being, our physical health, our emotional health, you know, where does this come from that in, we have to earn things the hard way, right? And we have to be deserving of any good things that show up in our life. Maybe you're working towards a goal in order to live a life that you want, or maybe there's a feeling of guilt, a tone of that that comes up when you receive good things, when you experience good fortune, you feel like you have to almost retroactively like pay that back. Um, and where does that come from, right? These are the questions that I invite you to sit with, to get curious. Um, I'll ask a lot of questions through the course of this episode because one or some might resonate with you. Different ones will land with different people. But my real goal is to open your eyes or to help you to ask more questions and, and take a look behind these models that we are perpetuating in a world that doesn't necessarily require it. In an episode that I shared a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about commitments, right? A lot of times our hard work mostly consists of commitments that we make through the job that we have agreed to do, um, through promises we have made to other people. Maybe you work a nine to five job and it's very clear what your commitments are. Maybe you are a consultant or a freelance or an entrepreneur and those commitments are a lot more amorphous. They come, they go, they have different finish lines, start and end dates. You know, how are we promising ourselves, our energy, our efforts out in the world? And here's the million dollar question along this line, whose priority are these commitments? You know, who are we benefiting by the promises that we make that tie up our time, our energy, our effort? to follow through, to do a good job, air quotes on that if you're listening, do a good job. Um, are these priorities aligned with our own values, with what is most important to us, with what we want to create for ourselves and our own lives, for our families, if you have one? Are these commitments relevant? Are they necessary? I encouraged you a couple of weeks ago in that conversation to do a bit of an audit, to take a closer look at according to whose priorities and for what personal reasons have you made these commitments and what can you clear out? What can you take off your plate? Because as you start to recognize where you can make space, hold up, don't just fill in that space with more work. 
right? We're not just looking for more ways to, again, air quotes, prove our worth, to test our mettle, to show up and serve, unless it is in line with the direction that we're going, with what is really, truly important to us, right? We don't, there's lots of presumptions and air quotes in this one. There's no, you know, we don't quote unquote deserve good things just because we keep working. My husband hates it when I talk about working smarter versus working harder, but sometimes we have to take a step back and take perspective and say, am I just working hard because this is the model that I've always done? This is what I do. I get up in the morning and I just start. I'm the energizer bunny, wind me up. Or is there a way to work smarter? Is there a way to ask for help, to empower other people and really let them shine by giving them space to carry some of the load that we usually put onto our own shoulders? Um, there are, of course, exceptions. So if you're looking at your commitments, if you're taking a look around, if you do that audit, you know, we can't always lighten our load enough that we can just not work as hard, right? There are situations in life, there are seasons, hopefully, where hard work is required, where from the time you wake up until the time you fall into bed, there are other people you need to serve and support, you need to answer to, right? If you are parents raising children, you know, their livelihood depends on you. So after you do the work that puts the food on their table, you are doing work to take care of them. Now, at what point you can encourage them to start being independent and take good care of themselves, that's a question for someone who has more parenting experience than myself. Um, but again, it helps to get perspective, to pull yourself out of the rat race when you can and check in and ask, are you doing hard work because it is necessary? Or is it just because it's a pattern that you've fallen into? It's the pattern that you were raised with that you see to be important and that you feel obliged to perpetuate. Or is there another way? Perhaps you're raising children. Perhaps you're caring for parents, um, sick family members. There are demands that come up in particular situations where it's hard to remove yourself from this. There's always something I need to be doing. There's never, you know, a lack of work. What am I supposed to be doing right now? If I'm sitting down, it's because I'm missing something. Um, but hopefully, as I said, it's a season. Perhaps that season is through the work that you are doing. You are answering a call, a passion. It keeps you up nights. You know, I can certainly relate to that. Last fall, when I hosted the Thriving Life Summit, which I was extraordinarily proud of, in retrospect, I literally pulled some all-nighters like I have not since I was in college working on theater productions. You know, even after college working in theater, we didn't have to put in those kinds of all-nighters. But there are seasons, even in different industries where time crunches and hectic schedules, you know, are also perpetuated and almost normalized. But if it's going beyond a season, if it extended beyond that particular project, and I really, I know now in retrospect, looking back through this whole year, it didn't only take me a week or a month to recover from that season of complete commitment and devotion. It actually took me the better part of this year to really break myself out of the pattern, to take a step back and take a look at and challenge myself what am I doing? What am I so busy with? What is the ultimate outcome? What's the highest and best outcome of what I'm doing? And is it aligned? Is it worth it? Is it worth sacrificing my physical health, my well-being, the um, ability that I can bring to future projects? Am I bringing less of myself to everything else because I'm doing too much for too long? So how can we look to these situations and seasons in our lives and make sure that they don't ripple over, that they don't carry on, that that pattern doesn't become established and we again lose track, you know, lose that reference point of what work is necessary and when do we get to take time for ourselves? So 
These are some big questions, right? Seasons can be hard to see, and how do you break out of that pattern? How can you even begin to believe that life can be easy or easier if that's where you have to start? You know, look around for evidence. Look for those successes, those experiences in your life that came so easily it was effortless. What is something that you saw, that you desired, that you wanted to achieve or experience, and it seemed like everything just accommodated it, that everything came into play, like the pieces moved around on the chessboard and you could just see the path. And why can't it be that this can be the case more often? Why did that have to be the exception instead of the rule? And as I mentioned earlier, and I haven't read it, and I certainly have not figured out for myself the four hour work week, but there are a lot of people who dig into productivity and the ways that we use our attention and our focus and the ways that we delegate tasks to let other people step into their greatness, to shine in their own right, to not feel that the weight of the world rests on our shoulders. And by doing less, we can accomplish more. So how can you strategize? How can you prioritize what you do with your time, energy, and attention? And how can you clear the way? I love the, I believe it's the Eisenhower um, prioritization matrix, you know, where on one column you have important and not important. And then on the other column, you have urgent and not urgent. And you can really take a look at how many unimportant but seemingly urgent things crowd your to-do list. How much time get devoted to those versus the important but not urgent items that usually get edged off the list. Think about how some of those things could move the needle on your business, could move the needle on your ability to be focused or productive in the work that you do a training, a class that you would love to take but haven't made time for, um, the meditation practice or mindfulness, if that's less triggering, that gives you a little mental space to clear the noise and start the day centered, calm, and focused. You know, I really am an advocate of self-first scheduling. So if it's getting outside for a walk, if it's 20 minutes of exercise on a YouTube channel that you have found, fitness martial is a favorite, also yoga or Pilates videos, it depends on the energy and the mood of the day. But if you don't have it on your calendar and other people can jump in on your calendar, then you're always losing your own time, attention and priority. So how can you restore that? How can you bring that back to yourself? And how can you be picky about your commitments, about what you give your attention to, about the media that you consume? And how can you, be, as you're more selective, free up some of your mental space, some of your bandwidth for the things that matter? And just because you've made that space, don't feel like you have to fill in the blank. Explore creating some white space in your schedule. If you have a meeting scheduler, if people can jump in on your calendar, build buffers around those meetings, 10, 15 minutes to stand up, to stretch, to clear your mind, to doodle or do a crossword puzzle, to reset so you come back with more focus and a fresh mind for your next effort. So you're not running on a half, em half full tank or half empty tank, I guess it's all perspective. You're not running on half full and working at less than your maximum capacity. So I encourage you to, with all of this consideration, and I'd love to hear what you think. Let me know what stands out for you. Let me know a way that you feel inspired to create some of this white space, to incorporate more playful activities, five, 10 minutes, you know, a crossword, a coloring book. They've been wildly popular. You can get one in every genre. How can you make space for the little things that light you up? How can you make some space for rest to balance out the work that you do? Jot down your insights, your ahas, you know, track your time for the week, or even make note right in your calendar about the things that you notice, the ways that you can start to shift this energy and attitude about the hard work and bring a little more play into your work. 
and please let me know how this starts to shift for you, how you see opportunities to lighten your load, to be lighter in the work that you do. And um, if this episode resonates with you, I hope you'll share it with a friend. Join me again in the Facebook group, Live With Less Stress, to continue the conversation and take good care of yourself. I'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us today. To learn more about living life with less stress and more flow, visit happifiedlife.com. Subscribe on your favorite player to catch the next episode as soon as it's out. Sharing really is caring, so please rate and review the show while you're there. And if you know someone else who would love it, please pass it along. Until next time, my friends, keep on shining.